Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Dix, BC's Minister of Health. Uh, beside me is Dr. Bonnie Henry, our Provincial Health Officer for British Columbia. Uh, I just want to let uh, members of the of the media and the public know that we will be doing a briefing tomorrow, Saturday. It'll be here and it'll be at noon. I want to acknowledge the territories of the uh, Musqueam of the Squamish of the Tsleil-Waututh, where we're uh, giving this uh, briefing today, and I wanted to introduce uh, our provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, so today uh, we are announcing that we have uh, 77 new cases uh, tested here in British Columbia for a total of 348 people. Um, th this includes 200 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 95 in the Fraser Health Region, 30 in Vancouver Island, 19 in the Interior Health Region, and 4 in the Northern Health Region. Of those, 22 people have been hospitalized, are in hospital at the moment. Uh, 10 of those people are in ICU, and 6 have now recovered fully from this disease. Um, I did want to uh, talk uh, as well. We have a couple of uh, long-term care facility outbreaks, including in our numbers, uh, a new healthcare worker who's identified um, uh, associated with the Dufferin Care Center, and that center is now um, being managed as an outbreak, as we do whenever we detect a case in a in a healthcare facility. So Fraser Health is addressing that issue um, today. Um, in talking about healthcare workers, I think that is something that uh, is always in the back of our minds as we've been going through this last number of weeks. And I do want to say that we have had a number of healthcare workers who have been infected with this virus. And today I really want to talk about my colleagues. I know how challenging it is when we are dealing with a new virus, a virus particularly for which we have no cure, we have no vaccine, we have no way of preventing it, and we know that it can cause quite severe illness in people that we love and people that we care for and people that we're close to. And it's been a tremendous challenge for our healthcare sector to watch what has been happening over this last few weeks and months around the world. And I have been watching with them very, very carefully and looking at what are the things that we need to do to best protect our healthcare workers and our healthcare sector here. And I want my, um, and so much, of course, in the beginning is very unclear. But I do want to say we do know so much more now about this virus here. And we know that hundreds of people have been safely cared for by our healthcare worker teams here in Vancouver, here in BC, here in Canada over the last few months. And we know that they're safely cared for because of the dedication and the, the intense um, practice that we have in our healthcare worker system. We know as well that about two dozen of our healthcare workers here in British Columbia have been affected with this virus. And I'm relieved and uh, happy to say that none of them have had severe illness. All of them have had very mild illness, and there have been some very short hospitalizations, but for the most part, people have been managed at home, and that is something that we're grateful for. It is everything that we do in the healthcare work in the healthcare setting that keeps us safe from this virus. And these are things that I've talked with with my colleagues many times over the last number of weeks. It's identifying cases early, and we've seen that around the world. It's when we have unrecognized cases that are in a hospital or in a care home that it gets transmitted, and that's when people can get sick, and that's when it gets passed on to others. It's making sure that we have administrative processes in place so we minimize the people that are in contact with somebody who's sick. We make sure that as soon as you go into the hospital, and we talk about this a lot, about the importance of calling ahead, and as soon as you go in with the respiratory symptoms, you're given a mask to prevent you from putting your droplets out there, prevent other people from being exposed. It's, um, it, it's the engineering things, like putting someone in a single room, like making sure we have the right air exchanges in our hospitals and our settings. And of course, it's the personal protective equipment that healthcare workers wear that protect them as well. And I know there's been a lot of angst and a lot of concern that we're not going to have the supplies that we need to best protect our healthcare workers across the spectrum, whether it's in the pre-hospital care, in home care, whether it's our community physicians, whether it's our hospitals, our long-term care homes. 
And I want to say that right now, we have been working on this across the province and across the country. And we do have the supplies that we need right now. And we are committed to doing everything, everything that we can to make sure that we continue to have what we need to best protect everybody in our health care system right now. And that's my personal commitment as well. Finally, I do want to say a little bit about um, the fact that you know, we, we have had these social distancing measures in place, we've had gatherings um, that have to be curtailed, and, but we do, need to, we do need to make sure that we still have the resources that are available to support us. Um, we need businesses to support um, our healthcare workers in particular, make sure we have food, make sure we have childcare, and details around our childcare um, strategy to support our essential workers will be coming out very shortly. But we also need to make sure that we that uh, that there is um, appropriate precautions that are taken in certain settings to make sure that we are not um, allowing settings that allow transmission of this virus. And we go back to the reasons that we're doing this. The reason that we're doing this is so that we can build a firewall. We can prevent transmission of this virus between us so that we can prevent the people who are going, that are the most susceptible to having severe illness or dying from this disease from being uh, exposed to it in the first place. And that's the reason why we're doing all of these very extreme measures in many places. And it's become clear to me that there are certain settings where this is really a challenge. And we talked earlier about, uh, about restaurants. And we put in um, some guidance around being able to, to maintain a distance within the restaurant. And it is uh, becoming obvious, as it has to many of the municipalities around here, that this is a very challenging thing to do. So from today, um, uh, my order is that uh, restaurants must move to a takeout or delivery model only as a way to best protect us and to ensure that we can maintain those distances. I also say that you know, for many businesses, they can and should stay open to support us, but they need to have the important social distancing measures in place to ensure there's not that many people in the office environment, for example. There's not face-to-face -face meetings. There's not congregation in groups. It's also important, and I've talked about this, for us to go outside. But like we do when we're inside, we need to go outside with our close family, with our small groups. We're not to be outside in groups. We're not to be out playing basketball. We're not to be out um, sitting together in large groups on the beach watching the beautiful sunsets that we have. Because when we're out in groups like that, the chances are that somebody will be exposed to this virus, and then we'll bring it home to our family and our communities, and that is what is going to spread the virus. So right now, and again, this is not forever, but right now, we need to be in small groups. We need to be with our family. We need to be with our close friends, one or two of us. And we need to maintain our distance with others. You know, we must be united in these efforts, and we need to build that firewall and make sure that we, put, we keep it as strong as we can and that there are no gaps. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry, and uh, I wanted to just uh, lay out a couple of things that have uh, changed and some new information that people have been asking for that I think people will be interested in. As Dr. Henry has said, 77 new cases today for a total of 348 province-wide. To put that in context, 22 of those cases are in acute care that's compared to or in, in hospital compared to 17 yesterday and 10 are uh, in ICU uh, compared to nine yesterday. Uh, and I just want to put in context for a moment. Uh, two weeks ago, the Premier and uh, Dr. Henry and I laid out our uh, pandemic preparedness plan. We had been uh, at stage one in dealing with acute care hospitals in terms of preparing them and opening up space. And uh, this Monday, we went to stage two with the cancellation of non-urgent elective surgery. I just want to briefly report out how significant these actions have been and what they've meant and what they mean in the system. Prior to the COVID-19 response, uh, we averaged about 103.5% capacity in our acute care system. 
that capacity as of now, our snapshot as of today, is 78.5 percent. That's a change in occupancy in a very short period, and in particular this week, of 25 percent, or 2,398 beds. Uh, in addition, um, our critical care beds uh, are at 61.8 percent capacity. And I just want to put this in context because uh, there's a lot of discussion of what people are doing in terms of preparing. But I think in terms of preparedness, as I said, uh, as I just said, 22 uh, patients currently in acute care. Just to put it in context, this preparedness is not what happened in other jurisdictions. And this shows how much we've learned from other jurisdictions. We've acted. And the, our actions have had consequences for a lot of people, as you can see in these, uh, in these bed numbers. But we've acted now to ensure that our, that our acute care sector, that our hospitals are more prepared for uh, a possible surge or influx of patients. And this has required extraordinary effort by everyone in the acute care sector, and I wish to thank them. We released and published uh, uh, this morning, I believe, on the BCCDC website, the testing numbers for this week, which I believe are 17,000. 912. Um, I want to uh, echo what uh, Dr. Henry said uh, about uh, the healthcare sector, about healthcare workers, that we must do everything possible to support our frontline workers in hospitals, long term care, the entire healthcare sector, to give them confidence that they can do their jobs with the lowest possible risk of their health and well being. Frontline staff are critical to beating this virus. They are critical to beating this virus. I know all British Columbians support this goal, and I want to say this directly to doctors, to nurses, to care aides, to those who keep our hospitals clean and safe, to food support workers and everyone else on the front line. We are grateful. We are enormously grateful for all your efforts. We're making headway together uh, against this threat, but we're far from prevailing. Everybody knows that. But we also know, Dr. Henry has said it, that you're performing miracles every day. I want to make it as clear as I can. We're going to spare no effort to ensure that you have the equipment you need to get the job done, including the equipment to keep you safe. We do have supplies in place, and we're identifying more. We will, of course, respect your collective agreements and do what it, what it takes to provide the additional support, childcare, and extra accommodation to help you work effectively. We'll track down and punish anyone caught misappropriating, the better word is stealing, the supplies we need for your protection. But our health care system doesn't exist in a vacuum. It needs support from every part of society and every part of the economy, and those essential services must continue. They cannot be shut down. They're equally critical to beating this virus. Of course, we know, and we've said it, and everybody understands how important care aides and nurses and doctors are. But so are pilots flying test kits to labs, early education workers caring for our health workers' kids, grocery workers making sure we're all fed, and longshoremen moving critical supplies across the dock. We are grateful for your work, too. It must continue under safe conditions. And we're taking additional steps to clarify the conditions under which important work can continue, both in health care and the wider economy. We'll have more to say on this shortly, but we'll be calling on employers, unions, and WorkSafe to develop the protocols under the supervision of Dr. Henry to give those working in the economy the confidence they are doing so safely. Of course, in addition to this, and Dr. Henry has made it clear with respect to restaurants, and I've had occasion to talk to a number of mayors, including the mayor of Vancouver today, uh, clarity about restaurants and the fact that they can only operate on their takeout basis. And I want to say this, there's lots of discussion about um, all of the, uh, of the group of people that may not be following uh, Dr. Henry's orders. It's our expectation that we all do so. It's what we owe to one another, and we must continue to do that. I want to say a couple of extra things. Yesterday, we convened the Isabel McKenzie, the Seniors Advocate, s staff of the Ministry of Health, and MLAs from all parties, including Shirley Bond and John Yap, uh, who are Liberal members, uh, including Ronna Ray Leonard and uh, Janet Rutledge, who are NDP members, and Sonia Firstino, uh, the Green Party House Leader, to work together to build on the groundswell of community goodwill that is out there to support seniors. They've come back and reported with recommendations that working and using in, in alliance with Better at Home and the United Way to, make, uh, to support seniors who are currently dealing with the consequences of social isolation necessary to protect their health. We'll have more to say about this on Monday, but I want to thank all the members of that committee uh, and, uh, the, and the, the actions that they have recommended are being put 
into, into motion. Finally, I just want to say we are all in this together and we're, today we're going to find more ways to be all in in the fight and tomorrow we're going to find more and we need everyone to join us. We've said it before, but we need to say it again and again and again, not just in settings like this, but to one another. That, uh, that we, have, we know, because Dr. Henry has laid it out, some of the toughest measures any, anyone has seen that are required for all of us to keep each other safe. Some of it is simple, soap and sleeve and social distance and self-isolate and stay home when you're sick and support seniors and elders and those who are vulnerable. But starting now, there's no longer any room for almost or pretty good or nearly enough. Starting now, our individual fight, our collective fight must be 100% all of the time and 100% of the effort and 100% right. I know it's a lot to ask of a lot of people. I know people don't get the information all at the same time, but we need to give our healthcare workers, our healthcare professionals, Dr. Henry, a whole team of people around the province who are preparing to deal with the health consequences of this virus. We need to give them the flattened curve they need to provide the continued service and the continued care that will help everyone in the province. Right now and every moment from here on, going all in on COVID-19 will save lives and, the, and the, our own lives and those of the ones we love. It's just that simple. Nous annonçons 77 nouveaux cas de COVID-19 aujourd'hui pour un total de 348 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Parmi les nouveaux cas, un réside au Dufferin Care Center, un établissement de soins de longue durée à Coquitlam. Les équipes de santé publique et de contrôle des infections à la Régie de santé de Fraser sont sur place. Chaque Régie de santé en Colombie-Britannique compte maintenant des patients atteints de COVID-19. 200 dans, sont, sont dans la Régie de santé de Vancouver Coastal, 95 à Fraser, 30 sur l'île de Vancouver, 19 à l'intérieur et 4 au nord. De plus, sur le total des, des cas de COVID-19, 22 personnes sont, sont actuellement hospitalisées, 10 euh, sont en soins intensifs et les autres euh, patients sont à domicile isolés. We're ready to take your questions. Thank you, Minister Dix.